able to pause and kind of walk, step through it, you can do that as well. You'll always have access to this recording. Um, I'm going to show you how to find additional training resources and information, and that should be uh, very helpful as you start working in Canvas. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions while I'm talking. You can type questions into the chat, and at the end, we'll have hopefully some time to just ask open questions, general questions about Canvas. And I will make sure that you all know how to get into the level two training and the Canvas subscription training, which are resources uh, available to you through TCC. OK, that's our goals for today. And here's a list of what we're going to try and cover today. And that is a lot of stuff. Um, and hopefully the things that you're most interested in are included in that list. And really what they spend, what we spend time on in level two training is digging a little deeper into a few of these topics. Um, so you'll have more time to kind of practice in level two. And hopefully between now and when you take level two training, you'll have some processing time. So you'll be a little bit more used to Canvas. All right, so we're gonna get started. And the first thing you have to do is log in. So, oops, log into Canvas and you should open it to something that looks generally like this. You probably won't have this many quiz or this many courses in your dashboard. Uh, I've been doing stuff in Canvas since February, so I have lots of stuff in here. Um, you may have have one or two courses in your dashboard, you, but you should have logged in and it should look something like this. And we're going to look at the dashboard for a few minutes and make sure you know where all those important things are. So all the way to the left, this is called the global navigation menu. It's called that because it's not specific to a certain course or um, a certain activity in Canvas. It's always there um, and it will help you navigate to the most important things in Canvas. I'm going to check the chat just to make sure nobody's having a can't sign in meltdown. All right, good, good, good. So this is the global navigation menu. And anytime you hear global navigation, that's what that means. And you'll notice that if I open up a course, that global navigation menu stays there. I can always access it, OK? This screen is called the dashboard, uh, and that's probably a term most of us are familiar with. You'll be able to see your published courses and your unpublished courses. And this looks different than Blackboard, but that works exactly the same way. So you'll get access to an unpublished course shell. So I'll show you. My summer courses are down here somewhere, yeah. You'll get access to an unpublished course shell 90 days before a course begins and it will become published automatically seven days before a course begins. So you don't have to worry about whether your courses are published or unpublished. That happens automatically. They get created as empty shells with student enrollments 90 days before the course starts, and then seven days before it starts, it's published, which means students can see it. That's the only difference between published and unpublished as published means students can see it. Unpublished means it's in progress or something you're working on, something you have access to, but not students. And so you, you can create your own sandboxes to practice in. You can create your own sandboxes to copy your content from Blackboard and to practice things in. Um, we didn't have that capability in Blackboard, but we do have that in Canvas. So if you create a sandbox just for your own personal use, it's not something that you would be using to teach students. You use this start a new course button in the right hand side. So if you don't have a sandbox or an empty course space to test out the functions in, I would suggest you go ahead and click start new course. And then we just call it, you know, Irene's test course, right? Canvas training test course, all right? And you can give it a short name. That's just, well, I'll show you where the short name and the long name show up. You will not have to create courses or name them for your active courses that you instruct students in. This is just to give you test spaces and sandboxes. So you want to go ahead and click on create course. And then Canvas will create that for you. And you'll see it in your dashboard. 
at the bottom. There's my Canvas training test course. All right. A couple more things on the dashboard. I want to make sure that you see you will have at some point in, in time. You don't have one now, probably. You will have a to do list for faculty, for instructors. Your to do list is things that you need to grade. So when students submit assignments, that shows up in your to do list as something you need to go in and grade. Now, if it's a quiz that grades itself, that won't show up in your to do list. But if it's something where you have to look at the student's work and assign a grade to it, that will show up in your to-do list. You'll see the name of the assignment, the course it's from, how many points it's worth, and when it was due. And so you'll see it kind of goes in due date order. The things that were due the, the earliest will come up at the top. Students to-do lists are in the exact same place and look the same, but they list assignments that students need to work on and submit. So if they had something due um, on Friday of this week, it would show up in their to-do list as kind of a reminder um, to draw their attention to it. Same with coming up. Anything that's in coming up is something that's due in the near future. It's something that, you, that Canvas is reminding you to pay attention to. And students will always have students do not have start a new course. That's not a button that they will have access to, but students will always have view grades right here, and that will take them to uh, a screen that lets them view all of their grades in their courses. So they don't have to go into a course before they look at their grades. So global navigation is the same for everyone at TCC um, and is always there no matter wh whether you're on the dashboard or inside of a course. These are tiles. That's what we call these course tiles. Um, and so this is just the same as if you saw the name of your course in Blackboard and you clicked it, then it would open your course. This is just kind of a better graphical representation. If you have courses, so if you created a sandbox or if you are looking for the Canvas training array and you don't see it, you can always click on courses in, Glo in Global Navigation and you will see all of your published and unpublished courses. But if you go all the way down to all courses, this is a list of every single course, published and unpublished, that you are in as a teacher or a student. And so you see there's a lot of courses here that have these stars filled in and a lot of courses where the stars are empty. If you wanna make sure that something shows up on your dashboard, put a star, uh, click the star so that the star's orange. And if it's a course that you don't need access to or um, a sandbox that you don't need to have on your dashboard right now, you can unclick the star and that will disappear from your dashboard. OK, so that way you can kind of manage what is showing up on your dashboard and what isn't. You can also create a sandbox from this screen as well by pushing on plus course. So that's where the courses menu takes you. And one thing I would recommend is that you have the Canvas training array uh, favorited. Make sure you click that star so that it's orange. You want that to be on your dashboard. That's right now your reference point for Canvas training. Um, it has all the resources and the Canvas guides. It also has TCC quick links. Uh, right now, the Canvas trainers are um, managing that and keeping it updated. And then once we all get through this first round of Canvas training, then the instructional designers at Connect Campus will continue to keep it updated um, and manage that space so that it will always have up-to-date information. It will have new videos. You can request new resources be added to it. So you will have access to the Canvas training array for, for the whole time we have Canvas. And we're going to talk here about the calendar and the inbox um, and the rest of these functions a little bit later. And I just want to show you your account this is where you can set up your notification settings. You can, if you'd like to select which pronouns you want next to your name, um, you can change various settings associated with how you view Canvas and the, how you get notified of things that happen in Canvas. You just click on account and it will take you there. I think you can put it in dark mode if that's something that you prefer. So all of that stuff would be in account and then you have all of these various settings. All right, so far, no questions about the dashboard.
So let's look at notifications. So I clicked on account and I'm pretty sure that in the very near future we will be able to turn our profile photos back on. Uh, that's been approved by everyone. It just hasn't been activated yet. So that's coming. So one thing that you can customize in Canvas that you couldn't customize in Blackboard is notifications. So if you click on notifications, you're going to see a lot of information on one screen, <laughs> but that's good. So you have the ability to customize how often Canvas alerts you to things happening in the LMS. So students have all of these preferences as well, and they can come in and change their notification settings. If you have the app downloaded on your iPad or your phone, you can set up whether you want push notifications for certain things. So you'll notice if I click on one of these, I have the option notify immediately. So as soon as something happens in Canvas, I get an email. A daily summary, I think that comes at about 6 p.m. every day. Um, and so if you wanna know what things have been uploaded, what things have been changed, what things have been submitted, you can get a daily summary. You can get a weekly summary. So that would be things that are more high frequency and you don't want a ton of emails about it, or you can have notifications turned off. So for instance, I have notifications turned off for submissions because I don't want to be notified that my students have submitted work, right? I teach five classes. Uh, I have 100 students. I have two assignments per week. I don't want to be notified every time something gets submitted. I'm going to check Canvas. The things I need to grade are listed in my to-do list. I'm definitely paying attention to student work that gets submitted, but I also don't want an email about it. So I have that turned off, right? But if a student has typed something in the comments of their submission, so if they said something like, I'm not sure if this file uploaded correctly or um, did I do this correctly or something like that? I do want to be notified that they put that comment on their submission because it's almost like they're asking me a question or sending me a message. So I'm asking for a daily summary of that. Everybody is going to pick their own settings and there is no definitive right or wrong. The one thing that we are going to advise our students to do is set up notify immediately for announcements. And that's just because announcements tend to be relatively important information. In face-to-face -face classes, announcements might be, um, remember to bring this book or letting students know that class moved or got canceled. Um, and so that's something that we want students to pay attention to right away. But again, these are totally customizable and you might say, I'm getting too many emails, you can come in here and change it. Or you can say, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not noticing certain things happening, so you can come in here and get more frequently notified notification why i'd ever want a notification uh that i created my own announcement i don't know but i have that option should i want it so you can you can customize those and you can always change them and that is notifications all right so let's take a look at the training array and again that is this course space that you should all have access to. You are enrolled in the training array as a student. I'm about to open it and I'm enrolled in the training array as a teacher. So mine's gonna look a little different when we open it, but for the most part, the content is identical. So the training array was built for uh, our faculty and staff to get information about using Canvas, uh, building things in Canvas, instructional best practice, practices, getting you connected to might need things like Gmail or the VDI or things like that. So you'll see that it was built using um, the template, the course template that Canvas designed for us. So if you want your course to look similar to this, you will have access to get that course template and that will help you organize your information and make it a look kind of like this. There's lots of information in the training array, and I'm not going to click on all of these buttons and walk every, through every single thing because we would be here all day. Um, but there's the top five resources is definitely something you want to pay attention to. Um, these are the things that are most requested or most top of mind. So for instance, um, 
the course template that I just said, you can make your set up your course and design in a specific way. Some training videos. There are training videos created by Instructor. I'm going to actually open that so you can see what that looks like. These are in Microsoft Stream, so you might have to log in again. Um, but you'll see that there are videos in here that are very deep dives into specific topics. So if you're interested in SpeedGrader or the ins and outs of every single thing to set up quizzes or setting up modules and assignments, we go over each of these topics in your Canvas training, but we obviously don't cover every single thing. And so if you use a lot of quizzes, you'll want to be very familiar with these functions and you can watch these videos. These are these are edited videos um, created by Instructor of the live training sessions that the trainers went through. So Canvas trained us, uh, they recorded those training sessions, they edited those recordings, and that's what these are. So you got the real, real expert here walking you through those particular topics. And that's in the top five resources. And you also have these Canvas training videos from the Connect Campus. And we'll add to this, you know, for years and years, we'll just keep adding Canvas videos um, based on, you know, topics that are requested. So if you have a topic that you'd like to request that we make a quick video on, um, let me know and we'll, we'll put that in here. But you can see these are all less than 10 minutes uh, walking you through specific um, pieces of information in Canvas. The faculty checklist, if you just want a document that's like, let me make sure I'm good to go and I've not forgotten anything, the faculty checklist might be helpful to you. It looks like this. I zoomed way too fast, sorry about that. Um, but it just says, you know, at the beginning of course, make sure you've done all of these things. Um, the, the things at the top are kind of essential and these are recommended. And so this was created for us by Canvas. Um, so I know a lot of people are worried about forgetting something important, so that checklist might be helpful to you. We have common questions, migration guides, so lots of information just on the top five resources page. Um, the getting started button will take you to this module. And this is, you can see a module full of information about using Canvas. Um, so you can see, find videos, figure out course navigation, figure out how to put the template in your course. Um, how to get student information and FAQ, all of that stuff is in getting started. So if you're the kind of person who wants to look at things and click around and uh, look for information, that might be very helpful to you. And the last thing I want to show you is quick links. So you're probably used to these quick links on the right hand side being in Blackboard when you first sign in. Right on the left hand side, there's a quick links section uh, and that takes you to various things all around TCC um, that you frequently use and so the links are all right there so those links continue to be here they're just kind of hidden uh, in quick links and then these are things that uh, people ask for a lot so we wanted to make sure that they were highly visible and easy to access so we have the checklist here we have the Barnes & Noble textbook adoption that's something you have to do every semester those training videos are here um, things related to professional development are here. If you need to get your um, get into the Learn Center or uh, get into LinkedIn Learning, so uh, quick links are very helpful to you. It's this this page is part of the Canvas training array, but it's also right here in the Help menu if you click on TCC Quick Links. So that will take you directly to this page. So hopefully that makes it a little bit easier to access. We actually just put it in this in this help menu today. So that's brand new. You're the first people to know that actually. So if you click help, you can get to TCC Quick Links, um, which is perfect segue because I was going to do the help menu next. Um, so that's the Quick Links. This is this is our tech 24/7 help desk. So if you have um, a general tech issue with Canvas, 
you can do that. Ask your instructor a question is a super cool feature for students. They can click that and then they choose their class from a drop down menu. Now, if they're students, they're only going to have, you know, five courses here listed, not a bazillion. Uh, they find their class, you know, is it history? Is it English? They don't have to type in your name. Canvas knows who their government instructor is and they can send you a message. Um, so that is a super cool function for students. They can get to you through the inbox as well, which we'll cover, but that's something right in the help menu. So really any kind of help that you need in Canvas, whether it's help finding a TCC resource, tech help, help with your course, <laughs> um, a general help with Canvas. So this is to Canvas's help desk. If you report something that doesn't work in Canvas the way it should. Um, and the training services portal. So this is every kind of help you could possibly need through this help menu. And Canvas's mascot is a panda, so you're going to see pandas lots of different places. I bet you guys didn't know Canvas had a mascot, and now you do. All right, so I don't see any more questions. So let's talk about navigating a course generally. So I'm going to open up. A course and once you get a course set up, it'll look something like this. OK, so the course opens to whatever you have set up to be the home page and we will talk about setting up your home page. The course opens and looks like this. Anytime you want to see what does it look like to students, you can click this button up in the top right that says student view. It has a little glasses icon. Um, and if you click that, you'll get a pink box all the way around your screen. That pink box lets you know that you're in student view. And this way you can see what does it look like for students. And you can scroll through and you can click on things and you can make sure particular things are hidden or particular things are accessible. So you can always look at the course through student's perspective, and then when you're done and you're ready to leave student view, you can. Leave student view. So course opens to the home page. Um, and then you, this is your course navigation menu. So in the gray is your global navigation menu, and these blue links are course navigation menu. And this is how students find things in your course and access all of your content. So this is very similar to the course navigation menu in Blackboard, where students would click to get to announcements, to syllabus, to lessons. There's several things that are different about the course menu in Canvas. The first and most obvious one is you cannot create new links for this menu. So in Blackboard, if I wanted to add a link to the course menu that said meet your teacher or a link that said office hours or a link that said, um, you know, Smithsonian Institute website, I could add links in my course menu to external websites, to items in Blackboard. Uh, I could call my lessons learning spaces and I could create a link that said that and put it into the menu. You cannot do that in Canvas and that's not a design flaw. That's very, very intentional. Canvas wants students to have a very um, consistent experience navigating through Canvas. So in every single person's class, the content and the lessons are located in, in module or model plan or lesson folders. It's all called modules. So you have all of the same features plus lots of new features. The difference is that we want students to navigate to them consistently. You can easily change the order things show up in your course navigation menu. You click on settings at the bottom. That's a button you will see, but your students won't. And then you click on navigation. And this gives you the option to change how the course navigation menu works. So for instance, I don't use Pearson My Lab, so I want to get rid of that. I don't want it in my course menu. I can drag it down. Items up here are active. Items down here are inactive. 
or I can click on these three dots and just say disable and it moves it down. One thing that you're going to hear me say and whoever your Canvas Level 2 trainer say uh, is these three dots are how you access kind of the features of something in Canvas. And those three dots are referred to as the kebab. So I want you to imagine that you're grilling and you put, you know, a tomato and a piece of chicken and a piece of onion on a kebab. And that's why it's called that. So if you hear that word, that's what it means. It means those three dots. All right, and you may be wondering, what about my content from Blackboard if I want to set it up in my course? So there is a video in this Canvas countdown that walks you through how to uh, download a zip file of what you have in Blackboard and how you upload it into Canvas. So that video is, and I'll put a link to these videos in the chat. Don't watch it right now because then you'll not pay attention to me. But I want you to have easy access. And so it, you see this is a seven minute video. It's about a 10 minute process. I did pause the recording while I was waiting for things to upload or download because it's not really interesting to watch a bar, a progress bar fill in. But it takes about 10 minutes to open the course in Blackboard, download the zip file, or choose what you want downloaded, download the zip file, save that to your computer, and then upload it into a Canvas course space. So it's not a lengthy process. Um, and once it's in Canvas, it's super easy to copy from one course to another. So if you are working now toward your fall course design, your fall courses aren't available to you in Canvas yet. Again, they get set up and unpublished 90 days before the course begins. But you can build a sandbox. You can copy your Blackboard content into that sandbox. You can start working on it, updating it, designing it, moving things around, making it look the way you want it to look. And then you can, once it's all set up in the sandbox, very, very easy to move it into your actual course. So you'll see a few options here. Um, but let's say that I've built course in my sandbox and I'm ready to put it here into my into my fall course I would go into import course content and I can copy a canvas course and so if I had something called sandbox to copy from I could copy right from that sandbox all the content and then I just click import and it would move it over And all of that is available when I click on settings. So there's lots of things that you have in your course settings. We're gonna talk about some of them today and you'll talk about some of them in level two, but anything that you wanna change or update about the whole course, or the whole shell, you would do in course settings. And I want to show you my favorite secret feature. It's not really a secret, but most people don't use it. If you scroll all the way to the bottom of settings and you click on more options, you can show a few recent announcements at the top of your home page. I like to do that because that way students open the course to my home page, but they notice that I've posted a new announcement. So that's your extra bonus tip. Uh, to post announcements to your home page. All right. And before I give you time to practice that, I just want to talk with you for a minute about course navigation. So uh, all courses should be created with standard course navigation, and that's TCC wide. So um, again, we want students to have a consistent experience. We want items to be um, in the same place in every course, and we want students to always know where to look for things um, no, no matter which course they're in. So if you can imagine being a student enrolled in five different courses, it would be very helpful if the syllabus was always at syllabus, if the course content was always at modules, 
if the links in the course navigation menu were pretty similar in all of my courses, and then I wouldn't have to figure out and click around and get lost in the courses. So this is how your course navigation menu should be set up. I'm going to put that link in the chat for you as well. And so that's not something you have to do right away, but before your students get into your course, you want to make sure your course navigation is set up this way with th these links and really only these links showing for students. You can add any third party tools you use to the bottom of that list, but really only home syllabus announcements, modules, grades, people and rubrics should be showing for your students. Those links only and then add any third party tools. So Proctorio, Pearson MyLab, whichever ones you use. Um, and if you don't use any, then you would just have home syllabus announcements, modules, grades, people rubrics. So you're going to hide a lot of things. You're going to hide things like collaborations, assignments, discussions, quizzes, files, pages and outcomes. Most of those are things that are uh, primarily in there for us to use as faculty for building content, arranging content, uh, and finding particular things that we need to teach the course. Okay, so now I'm gonna give you a few minutes to practice logging in, finding or making a sandbox course, just kind of clicking around um, the course navigation, the layout, the settings, and just kind of test out some of the things that we've been talking about. It'll also give you a chance to type in any questions you have about what we've gone over so far. So take a couple minutes, play around, and let me know what questions you have, and then we'll move on to the next slide. That's a great question, Robert. So um, about 6,000 courses were copied by Canvas uh, from Blackboard into Canvas. 6,000 is a very small fraction of the number of course uh, shells that we have in Blackboard, if you think about all the semesters and all the teachers. So if you have anything in your course list that says 2020 fall, that is content that was copied over by Canvas uh, from Blackboard. So anything that's from 2020 fall, that is copied content. If I open this up, it's going to have, have all my content. And for some reason, take a long time to load there. So that's all my content copied over from Blackboard. If you don't have something that in your course list that says 2020 fall, then you don't have any content that was copied over and you will have to manually copy it over yourself. Again, that takes about 10 minutes. Um, and if you are teaching multiple sections of the same course, then you only have to do that once, right? Um, but anything that you want out of Blackboard files, courses, um, you want to get out of Blackboard by August because at the end of August, we won't have access to Blackboard anymore. Uh, 
And that's a great question too about Tutor 24-7. So that's one of those options that you can activate in the course menu navigation. So I clicked on settings in the course menu and I just need to find Tutor 24-7 and then drag it up or click on the three dots to enable it. And that will put it into my course menu and that will give students access to it. If you change anything in the course, make sure in the course navigation menu, make sure you hit save and then you'll see the change reflected in your menu. Absolutely, Robert, you can copy a fall 2020 course. You can copy a spring 2021 course. Um, you can copy. A course from. You know. It's coming up summer, you can copy it in the fall. Absolutely. Uh, yes, Proctorio is another one of those tools. Uh, so if you use Proctorio. That's also something that you can find settings, navigation. Secure exam proctor. So again, you click the three dots, enable it. And then if you use Respondus, that's called Lockdown Browser. But if you don't use Respondus, you can click the three dots and disable it. And then again, just remember to hit save. All right. So Bobby, that's a great question you just asked and I'm going to talk about accessibility, I think in part three. So just bring that question back uh, in just a little bit. So something that is kind of fundamentally different about Canvas from Blackboard, if you're used to using Blackboard, is um, how you construct things. So in Canvas, uh, content is built in something called a page. So you're used to building things in Blackboard called items, and in Canvas, you're going to build things on pages. Pages can be whatever you want them to be. So you're going to build a home page using pages. If you have notes and a lecture video that you want to embed in lesson one, you put that content on a page. Uh, if you have information about reading assignments, you're going to put that on a page. If you have something at the beginning of a lesson that says here are the objectives for the lesson, here's the to-do list for the lesson, you're going to put that on a page. So all of those things go on pages. Assignments go on assignments. Quizzes go on quizzes. Um, discussions go in discussions. But content that you build all goes into pages. And when you copy something over from Blackboard, anything that was previously an item, so a big space that had text or videos or pictures, it got copied over into Canvas as a page. So let's look at pages and let's practice creating one. On. And while we look at something called the RCE, which is the Rich Content Editor. So you get to pages by clicking on, guess what? Pages. When you click on pages in Canvas, it takes you to your front page, and that's just the page you selected to be the front of your pages. <laughs> but you can always click on View All Pages, and you can see this is a course that got a bunch of stuff copied into it so there's a lot of pages here okay but i want to create a new page so let's say that i want to create a home page or i want to build the page where i put information for a particular lesson i can always click on plus page okay pages all get titles 
so maybe this is a page for my students called advice for reading short stories. It could also be um, Thomas Jefferson lecture. It could also be um, algebraic equations. I don't know what math things are. Uh, I try. So in a page, you put a title and then you have this whole menu, which is the rich content editor. In Blackboard, you might be familiar with the text editor, and this is very, very similar, but it's the rich content editor because you have a lot of different things you can do. So obviously, I can type text, right? I can edit text, so I can highlight it, I can bold it, I can italicize it, I can make it a different color. I can highlight it. Please don't highlight it yellow and then have text in green. Yeesh, that's ugly. Uh, I can do the same kinds of formatting that you can in Word, so you can make something a heading, right? Heading three. So that will help you organize text. If you have things in a Word document, I know you can't see the document that I just opened because I'm only sharing my browser screen, but you can open a Word document. I actually don't have any Word documents on my computer, but you can copy and paste text from a Word document and it opens up really nicely in the rich content editor. Let's see. Just find a random document here. My computer's being a little bit weird. Uh, yes, you can do the HTML. If you don't care about HTML, you can look away. But if you do, uh, right here at the bottom is the HTML editor. So you can do that as well. You don't have to. So that's not something that you have to do. But I know a lot of us who are familiar with HTML and you want to perfect particular things, you can do that really easily. Uh, but if you, you don't know what that means, that's OK too. All right, well, I was going to show you how to copy things out of Word, but I think my Word is not opening. So imagine that I've copied text. Um, again, you can put a link. So there's two kinds of links that you can use in Canvas. Um, So the first thing that you can do is create something called a course link. And when I get to hit the drop down next to the link, I can go to course links. And this allows me to link students to anything else in the Canvas course. So it can be a different page, right? So maybe I wanna remind them of MLA citation guidelines. I can link them to an assignment. So maybe this is a lecture page. This is a notes page. But I want to say we're preparing for this upcoming assignment and I can link students to an assignment in the course. I can link them to a quiz, to an announcement, to a discussion, to a module uh, or to course navigation. So I can link them to announcements in general or discussions in general, right? Um, and then I can also, well, let me just do a course link right here. Right. I've highlighted the text, then it will turn it into a course link. All right. And then you can also do just a normal, right, regular link. So then just go to external links, and this would be to a website, right? Okay. And links show up as blue. You can embed a picture. This is also super cool. So if you have images elsewhere in the course, they'll be in course images. So you don't have to upload them again. OK, and then I can. Right click on it, drag the corner down to resize it. 
But what if you don't have an image? You're like, this needs something graphic. I don't have anything already uploaded. You can upload something from your computer. Or if you click on Unsplash, this will actually take you to royalty-free uh, images that you can use mostly for decorative reasons, but sometimes you might find some content in here. So if it's a unit on Shakespeare, for instance, I might type Shakespeare and I will get an image of some old timey books. I might get an image of the Globe Theater, uh, of a statue of Shakespeare. So I can select that and click on submit. Well, that's a huge picture. I don't want one that big. So I can just make it smaller. I can um, upload media. So if I have a video or an audio file um, that would go on this particular page, I could upload it here. If it's already uploaded somewhere else in the course, I can link to it right here. Of course, if you have a Word document or a PowerPoint document, you can upload it. And then what the cool thing is, it turns it into a link. So I find a file on my computer. Uh, just trying to find a file that doesn't have any students' names on it open and submit so it uploads the document but it turns that into a link so if students click on it it will open the document for them you can embed a youtube video in any place that you have the rich content editor so if it's a video you created or a video that you search for and found you can add that you can embed it. But what if you don't have a video on YouTube? What if you wanna put a video on this page? This is my lesson on advice for reading short stories. I have great advice. I wanna record a five or 10 minute video for my students. Canvas has a built-in video platform system called Studio. This is a full video platform system, which means that you can use it to record, you can use it to upload, and you can use it to host all the videos. Students, those videos will be embedded in your Canvas course. The students can click play, and the video will play directly in Canvas. It's stored in Canvas. Students can also use Studio. So if you have a speech class or a business class, and you need students to make presentations and record them, they can use Studio as well. You can upload a video or an audio file for just one student. So what if I want to kind of explain where they went wrong with a particular assignment? When I'm giving grade feedback, I can hit the studio button and uh, create a quick video walking students through that. Okay, so if you have the MP4s on your computer, I know over the last year, a lot of you created a bunch of videos. And so maybe you have those files on your computer, in which case you can just click add and you can upload them all to Canvas. And then you, once you get into the lessons where you want them to be, you can embed them. You might want to create a quick video, in which case you will click on record and you're gonna get two options. You're gonna get screen capture. So if you wanna walk them through a set of slides or show them how to navigate the library website, you can screen capture. I'm so and then if you wanna talk directly to your students, so if you want it to be your face, looking at your students while you're explaining something like a lecture video, that would be a webcam capture. You have either option there. And this stores them in your Canvas Studio library. So I only have two here now, but you eventually might have dozens of videos, in which case you can search, right? So you're trying to look for your short story video, you can search for it. So I'm gonna embed a video from Canvas Studio. You can allow students to comment on the video. I would never do that in a million years, so I turn that off. You can also allow students to download it, uh, and that might be a nice function if you want students to be able to, you know, 
uh, play it on their phones or something like that, but you don't have to select that either. And then you click on embed and it puts it right there. So I no longer have to put things in YouTube. This will create captions automatically, just like YouTube would. And students don't have to navigate to YouTube. You don't have to store your content externally anymore. You can manage it right here. Uh, I'm not gonna get into the ins and outs of Studio just because that is a training in and of itself, but I will tell you that you can make video quizzes. So let's say you have a five minute video at the one and a half minute mark, students pause, they have to answer two questions and then they move on and they pause and they have to answer two questions and that's a quiz grade. So that functionality is supported in Canvas Studio. You also have analytics so you can see who watched it, who watched how much of it, where did students stop watching it, did a particular student, you know, only watch the first 10 seconds of it, etc. You can see all of that information as well. Uh, again, just very important reminder that if you have a video that you want to make sure that you do turn the captions on for that video and that uh, we would never, ever recommend that you upload a video that's longer than 10 minutes. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of research studies that support uh, videos being sh 10 minutes or shorter to maximize uh, the student learning experience. If you have a 40 minute lecture on advice for reading short stories, make four videos. Break them up based on subject, based on topic, and make them four shorter videos or five shorter videos um, and let students work through them one at a time. All right, let's get through the rest of the RCE. So you can, um, you know, left align, center, right align. You can bullet, number, uh, indent, reverse indent. You can, um, oops, I don't know exactly what I just did. Sorry, Teams was covering it up. This will give you a chart. So if you wanna build a table in Canvas, you can build a table. And you, again, you have some functionality similar um, to what you have in Word. This is the math equations editor. I don't know if there are math instructors in here. Um, I don't know math, so I'm not going to do this correctly, but you can do things in here related to math. All right. Again, I don't know what most of these things mean. Insert. Um, and then you can embed things. So if you have an embed code from Spotify or from YouTube, you can embed uh, copy and paste that embed code. If you don't know what that means, that's okay too. It's kind of like the HTML thing. If you're into that, the function's there. If you don't know what it is, you don't have to click on it. Um, and then you have all of these options as well. So you can undo something, you can cut and paste, um, you can change your view so you can make it full screen if that helps you. You can insert things using this menu. One thing I think is pretty cool is you can insert a horizontal line. And so that is something I use a lot. It just puts a line between things. So if you're going from one topic to the next or you want to uh, give a kind of graphic clue to students that change topics. Uh, and then these are for the most part the same functions just in the menu. You can get a word count and then you can build a table. The last thing I want to show you in the rich content editor is this plugin button. And this is even more apps to um, the rich content. So this is the ability to create a Teams meeting right inside uh, of the content editor. Students could click a link and join a meeting. Uh, Office 365 is really your OneDrive. So if you had a document in your OneDrive, you could link to it directly. Canvas Studio, YouTube, we have a few others in here as well. So um, if you use Soft Chalk or you use Vimeo, those are available to you as well. And that's from this little plug, because they're plugins. And then the last thing I'm gonna do before I uh, save this page is I'm gonna look down here and I'm gonna click on this little man. This is the accessibility checker. And this makes sure 
that everything that I've created is fully accessible for all students. And this gets back to the question that Bobby asked earlier. So if I have an image, I should have an image description. And that's again for our students who might be visually impaired and they need an image description because they um, aren't able to see the image clearly. All right, apply. And then once everything meets or passes the accessibility checker, you'll get these little celebratory balloons that tell you, all right, you did a good job. Now this isn't a super deep uh, accessibility review. So I linked a document here. It didn't do an accessibility review of that document. It just reviewed my images and my text formatting essentially. And so I do want to point out that when you're done working on something, you have some options at the bottom. You can save and you click save. If you're done working on it for now, you want to save your work, but it's not really ready for students to see yet. But if you're done, you're ready, it's perfect, or at least it's as good as it's going to get, you click on save and publish. And up here you'll see the green check mark that says page is published, which means that it's visible to students. So if you created something and students say, uh, I can't access that quiz or I can't read those notes, chances are you have forgotten to publish it. If it's not published, it looks like this at the top. It's real easy to publish it. You just click it again and it gets green. And there's kind of no guesswork here. It's green and it's published or it's grayed out and it's not published, all right? So that's how you create a page. And again, you have all of those features available um, in terms of creating content and organizing content on the page. But if you remember, we want our, our courses to have only certain links available to students in the menu. Home, syllabus, announcements, modules, grades, people, rubrics, and then third-party tools that you might use. So how do students find pages or things that you've created? Students access course content through modules. Okay, so if you copied your content over from Blackboard or content has been copied for you, I'm just hiding those so they're not in our way. Then your modules page will look like this and you will have all of your content here already copied over. But if you're building a course or if your content copied over, but you want a new module or you want to separate modules or you want to organize it differently, you want to set up your modules, you click on modules and then right up here, you click on plus module and that builds or creates a new module. And let's call it right. And for them, I mean, in reality, right, your modules are going to be called something like module four, and then whatever you title it. I'm titling this one Monday evening training party, and then I'm going to click add module. When you create something in Canvas, Two things always happen. It adds it to the bottom of the page and it adds it in an unpublished state. So I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom. And here's my module four Monday evening training party. And you notice it's not published, which is great, right? I just built it. It's empty. It's not something I want students to see. So Canvas defaults to, to creating things in an unpublished state. But I want this at the top of the page so that I don't have to scroll the way bottom to work on it. So I'm going to click on and then come on. See, I have quite a few options for what I do with the module. I can edit it, which will let me change the name of it. I can move the contents, which is move things within the module. I can move the whole module. That's what I'm going to click on. Move it. I want it at the top. Canvas moved it to the top for me. All right. So now I want to add a page to this module. So I Sorry, I clicked too fast. So I click the plus sign right here at the top of the module, click the plus sign, and I can add anything that already exists in the course to the module. 
So if I created a bunch of pages or I created a bunch of assignments or created a bunch of quizzes and now it's time to put them in the right modules or if your content copied over from Blackboard um, and you're trying to reorganize it, the assignments are going to or the pages are going to be in the course, but you want to attach them to this specific module. You can choose them from this menu. But if you're building this module for the very first time and you don't have content to put in it because you're creating the content, you just add page, create page, right? So this is how you build a new page within a module. And if the, mo if the page was here, you could select it and add it in. So I'm going to say welcome to module four because all my modules start with a welcome item or a welcome page. Uh, an introduction that has the objectives and the to-do list for that week. So I'm going to create that item. And you see Canvas built it in an unpublished state. So that's how I added that page. I'm going to click the plus sign again. What if I have a page already here in the course that I want to put in this module? So maybe I want to put four Imagist poems in here. So my course copied over. I got a bunch of content from Blackboard. Poems belong in this particular module. All I do is click add item and it puts the page right into the course. I mean, right into the module. So then I've got my welcome, I've got my poems. Now I click the plus sign again and I want to add an assignment. Same options here. If the assignment already exists in my course, I can find it in the menu. and add it to the module. And if it doesn't exist yet, then I would just click on create assignment and come up with a name for it. And I could do the same thing for quizzes, for discussions. I can create a header and that just helps organize the content there in the module, an external URL, that's going to take students to, uh, I'm just going to pick that, that's fine. An external website. Or I can upload a file. So if you have something on your, com if you have something already in the course, you can find that file here. So writing exercises and add. Or if you have something on your computer, you just again click on create file and then you have the option to upload it. And my module is going to end with a quiz. So I go to the plus sign again and I select quiz. And let's say that it is this unnamed quiz because I create a bunch of blank quizzes for training and I'm going to add that item. And so here is my whole module, all right? And it's unpublished, which means students can't access the contents of this module, all right? Even though some individual items that I brought over are published, they're part of an unpublished module, so students won't be able to, to access them. So as a student, students are going to start navigating through your module by clicking Welcome. And this is a page, so again, I could add an image that says welcome. Right, so I could have my objectives, I could have my to-do list. I wanted to center the picture easily and then save. Okay, so as a student, I've opened the module. Here's the welcome to the module page. I click next. Here's the poem. So this is the page that I brought into the module. So as a student, I read all of this. I can click on the links. Then I would click on next. This is a writing assignment, okay? So I can, I see all the information about that. Oh, let me look at it in student view. 
This is what it looks like to students. So I'd see all the information about the assignment. When is it due? How many attempts am I allowed? When is it available? So you can see it's no longer available for me to submit to it. So I can still read the instructions, but it says this assignment was locked May 9th because that's how I set it up. And then as a student, I would. Oh, let me leave student view. So in Blackboard, probably students scroll down to find the next item and the next item. And in Canvas, they're going to click next to go to the next page. So this is the imagery assignment that I just created. Sometimes my external links are old, so let's pretend that worked because. I probably just pasted a weird link. This is a Word document that was somewhere in my course that I added as a file. So you see it's here. I can if students click on it. They could download that Word file, but it's showing in line here. Click next. And then this is that quiz. So that's how students move their way through a module. And that's kind of how you want to set it up. All right, so what if I've designed it this way and I'm like, you know what? This link, it really belongs in the May 7th module. It doesn't belong in this Monday evening module. Uh, how do I get it from here to there? Guess what? I can click these six dots over here and just drag and drop. And then if I wanted this assignment to be part of this module, I can drag and drop like that. And once I'm ready to publish the whole thing, I can click on publish. And you see all the items published. If I'm like, oh no, I don't want students to see that yet, I can easily unpublish it. And so th the module itself is not published which means students can't access the items inside of it. All right, so you really get into the ins and outs of creating assignments in your level two training, but I will just show you a few things about creating assignments. Um, so here's that imagery assignment that I made up so you can see there's no information here. Um, if you click edit, you get the rich content editor. So this is where you would put the instructions for the assignment. You have all those same options, the video, the image, upload a document, attach a word file, all of those things that you want, can do in the rich content editor. And then underneath it, you have your assignment settings. So how many points is it worth? What are, and this is, <clears throat> sorry, I have the hiccups. So submission type is new to Canvas, and it's actually very, very helpful here. So um, what are students submitting to you? No submission is if your students are doing a live performance in class. So you were, um, so you had your students giving a speech or doing a performance or dancing or singing. There's no submission. So you create the assignment. You have the instructions. You have the point value. No submission puts a column in your gradebook, but there's nothing students submit through Canvas. Online submission is anything that students are submitting to you online. A Word file, a PDF, a PowerPoint, a Google Doc, something from their OneDrive. If they're uploading a video, if they're uploading an audio file, uh, if they're linking you to a website they created, that's all online submission. On paper, exactly what it's like in a face class, you're handing something. So if you want to create uh, a column in your gradebook for something students are going to hand in, then you do on paper. An external tool would be something like McGraw-Hill or Pearson MyLab, right? But most of the time, we're going to have students do an online submission, right? Because they're going to upload something through Canvas. I would even do that in my face to face classes. That way I can't lose it, right? Uh, so then you decide what is it that students are submitting? 
Uh, are they just typing text in a box, in which case they get their own rich content editor? Um, are they submitting a studio recording? So are they making a video? Um, or are you going to have them upload Word documents or PDFs or PowerPoints? All right. How many attempts are they allowed? I tend to give my students two just in case they accidentally upload the wrong file the first time. I don't have to reset it. They don't have to worry about it. Plagiarism review. That's how you would add turn it in to the assignment if that's something you wanted to do and you get all the same kind of questions and features there. And then you have the due date and the availability dates. And one thing I definitely want to stress is that you should put due dates on everything. I know in Blackboard, a lot of us didn't put due dates on actual assignments. We created a course calendar that students followed, um, but they didn't. we didn't put due dates on the assignments themselves because Blackboard is so uh, less intuitive. And so it can be very time consuming to put due dates and change due dates and update due dates. Uh, I will tell you, it's very easy to change them in Canvas. It's very easy to update them. If you copy a course from fall to spring, you have the option to adjust the date. So you put in a new end date, a new new start date, a new end date, and it will cascade all the due dates and change them for you. Um, the due date shows up for you and students in the to-do list, in the calendar, uh, in the upcoming field. It auto populates the due date on the bottom of your syllabus. So it lists all of the assignments and when they're due. Uh, it's in lots of places, and so it really helps you and students stay on top of when things are due and when things are coming up. So it's very, very important that you put a due date on all of your assignments in Canvas. And if you change it in one place, it changes it everywhere instantaneously. So it's not as time consuming as it was in Canvas, I mean, as it was in Blackboard. So I'm going to go ahead and put a due date on here. Uh, I'm going to put May 28th is when it's due. I can hide it from students uh, so that they aren't available, that they aren't able to submit it any sooner than the 24th. Now they'll still see it if it's published, but they won't be able to submit to it until the 24th. And then it's due on the 28th. So after the 30th, they're no longer able to submit to it. Again, they'll be able to see it. So the information about the assignment will be there, but they won't be able to submit to it. And if I need to give a certain student or a few students an alternative due date if students get extra time or if somebody had an excuse or they were doing a school function then I could just click add I can type a student's name here and it would allow me to give them an alternate due date I could open it for them early or I could close it for them late and then if I wanted to add a rubric to that assignment I can do plus rubric. You can build a rubric here. If you had rubrics in Blackboard and you copied them over, you can just click find a rubric and it will actually show you every rubric and every course you have in Canvas. So you can borrow one from a different class. And then students would see it with the assignment. And my tip for you if you use rubrics is to click this box that says use this rubric for assignment grading. And that way as you click boxes in the rubric, it adds up those points and that establishes the grade for the student's assignment. And so this is what that will look like to students. Oh. I hit it, remember? I hit it until March. Let's go back down here. I always do that during training. I made it not available until March 24th. All right, save and go to student view. Oh, it's an unpublished The Canvas expert. Sometimes I forget I need to publish modules. All right. Now let's look at the assignment as a student. All right. So if I had typed instructions or I had a video for instructions, that would be right there. Uh, and you can see students have the due date, the points, what they're allowed to submit, 
how many attempts they've tried, how many attempts they're allowed, and when is the last day that the assignment will be open. And then they have the rubric available for them here. And if they want to submit it, they would click on start and then they could upload a file. And this works very much like um, it works in Blackboard. They choose a file from their computer. I'm going to choose. Um, sorry, I take so long choosing files. I just have a lot of Word documents from my students on here, which of course I don't want to upload. So I'm trying to be very careful with that. And if you're thinking she should have been more prepared, you're right. But um, I was grading until noon today and then I went insane. So. All right, I'm going to upload a random syllabus here. Click open. And then I'm just pretending to be the student again. I click on submit. And it's very clear to the student that they've submitted it and it's gone through successfully. So they have a plus, they have a check mark submitted, the details. They could download their file if they needed to. It says attempts one. So it's very clear to me I got it in. Right, so that's what it looks like for students. All right. Last thing I'm going to show you before we take our next kind of thought break is um, the syllabus. So. Syllabus is one of those course links that you should have available to your students. Uh, and so when students click on syllabus. They're going to get your course syllabus information. And then underneath your course information is a course summary. The course summary is automatically generated by Canvas based on your entering due dates into the course. So students can see all of the things that are due organized by their due date. All right. So that's automatically generated by Canvas. You don't have to put that course summary in there. If you attach due dates to your assignments, they will all show up right there in the course summary. The other thing that Canvas will do for you is set up your, uh, show students how grades are weighted if you've set that up. And we're gonna get to grade assignment groups uh, in a few minutes, all right? But to set up your syllabus itself, you just click on, you click on the syllabus link and then you click on edit and you have that rich content editor. You can absolutely copy what you have in a Word document and paste it directly into this rich content editor. That's what I did to get this information here. I copy and pasted from a Word document. OK, so it's very, very easy. The formatting remains. If you have things italicized, if you have things in here as headings, if you have lists, if you have bullet points, all of that stuff is in here. But you'll notice this says Blackboard because it's my old syllabus. So I do want to read through it and check it and make sure that I make any adjustments that I need to. All right. So that is syllabus. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to try some of these items. Try creating a page. Try creating a syllabus. Try creating a module. Try clicking on studio and seeing what happens. And then I will show you assignment groups and then we will uh, move on. So to and to answer Bobby's question, gradebook setup is what we do when we get to assignment groups. So absolutely, we're about to do that. But I just want to give you a few minutes because I gave you a lot of information there. Practice a couple of those things and let me know what questions you have.
Okay, I'm not seeing questions. I hope that means that we're doing a good job and I'm explaining it clearly and not that you have all passed out from boredom and or being overwhelmed by everything that we've gone through. So I'm going to show you assignment groups and then we will take an actual break uh, and give you five minutes to walk around, you know, get a coffee or a tea or a beverage of your choosing um, and then come back. So assignment groups are different from modules. Um, and again, assignments is a link that should be hidden from your students. If your students see assignments, they won't know what to do with the things they see when they get there. Um, you want students to access course content through modules. All right, so assignments is where you set up assignment groups. Now, if you use points in your class, so some things are worth five points, some things are worth 10 points, some things are worth 50 points, all those points add up to 100 or 1,000. And then, you know, students with 900 points or more get an A. You don't need assignment groups, right? Canvas is just going to add up your points and show students a raw total of points. And your syllabus is going to explain you need 800 or more points for a B, 700 or more points for a C. But most of us, I think, don't use points. We probably use weighted grades. We probably use assignment groups. Uh, that's the way I think most instructors set up grade books. And so the, if you use that for your grades, you're going to do that from assignments. A lot of things that you used to do in the grade book, you actually do uh, here in assignments. All right. So I'm going to click on the kebab. And you will see that I have an option for assignments, uh, assignment groups wait. And I'm just going to say, yes, I want to wait the final grade based on assignment groups. And so you see I have some groups already here. All right. And I can type in how much each of these should be worth. And it's going to keep a total here at the bottom. And you want that to say 100. Canvas will let you do whatever you want, but you want it to say 100. Otherwise, your students will be like, what? Right? So that's what I want it to be. But actually, huh, I have discussions and then discussion boards. So why don't I do this? Right? And so you can figure out how much you want everything to be worth. And then you click on Save. On this page, you will have all your assignments and all your assignment groups listed in kind of whatever order you created them in. All right. And that's why this is not really a page for students, because if you get here, you see lesson 11, lesson two, Tuesday research paper, right? There's not a discernible organizational pattern for students, and we want them to go through things sequentially. So if I scroll down, I'll see this is assignments. This is worth 20% of their total. And here's what's being counted as part of assignments. Here's essay grades. It's worth 50% of their grade. Here's what's being counted as an essay. All right. But what if I have an empty assignment group and I'm not using it? I can click on the kebab and I can delete it. If I try to delete an assignment group that has assignments in it, it will warn me. And it will say, do you want to delete the assignment also, or do you want to move that assignment to a different group? So you won't accidentally delete assignments if you do that. Again, what if I have um, something listed in discussions that's actually a research paper, right? I can move it to a different module, all right? So all I did is click the three dots, go to move to, and then I can choose whichever group I think it belongs in, all right? You can also drag and drop just like that, move it up. And if you need a new assignment group, you can just click on add group. And this is where you would be like, you know, So when you create assignments, 
You don't have to decide what group they go in. You can easily move things around from here in the assignments page. The other thing you can do in assignments is you can establish some rules. So if I click on the kebab for discussions, let me go to edit, and I can decide to drop one or two of the lowest scores in the discussions group. And all that's going to do is uh, drop the lowest score of any item listed in this group. I can also, if I wanted to drop the highest score, I don't know why I would do that, but I could. And if there was an assignment that was required, you can't skip it. I'm not dropping it. You can say lesson two discussion won't be dropped. You have to do that one and then click on save. So that's how you group your assignments and that's how you weight them. And that's kind of how you organize them. Again, very important that you hide assignments from your students because this page will not really make a lot of sense to them. All right, and in the grade book, you will have a total column, and that, if you have set up weighted averages, is going to show the student's current average right next to their name. You can move the total column all the way to the end, so it's the last column, but most people want to move it to the front, so I just click on kebab and I move to the front. All right. And so if you want to, oops, sorry. So if you want to move it, you can do it that way. All right. And so students can see their particular grades. And then if they keep scrolling, they see each of the uh, assignment groups, how much it's worth. So they see, okay, assignments is 10% of my grade. My average in that is a 90. Essays are worth 50% of my grade. My average in that is a 79. This is 20%. My average in that is 85. This is worth 15%. My average in that is an 89. So they see all of that information um, right there for them. And that those columns get automatically created when you set up assignment groups and weights. Um, and if you are interested in information about a student, you can click on their name. This will show you lots of great stuff. Uh, it will show you kind of how they're doing. So these bars show you how many points they scored out of how many were possible. Um, their activity compared to other members of their class. So are they more active? Are they looking at pages? Uh, three stars means more than everyone. One star means less than everyone. Two stars means about the same. You can see the last time they logged in. And obviously, I am my own test student. So this was a minute ago when I uploaded that fake, Im that fake uh, assignment. You can see their grades and you can go to analytics. And this will show you a lot of information, very granular level about students. What are they doing? What pages are they looking at? How often are they messaging you or each other? How often are they turning things in on time, late? How often do they have missing assignments? Um, and then kind of a, a chart of their grades compared to each other, the other students in the class. Now, this looks a little bit weird because I only have one student in this class, but this information would all be auto generated. So you can see doing. If you see their, this email logo, clicked it, I can send them a message, which I'm going to get to inbox in a minute, so I don't want to confuse things. All right. So lots of information uh, just by clicking on the student's name. All right. Um, and in the grade book, if you click the kebab next to any individual assignment, you have the option of curving grades for that assignment. You have an option of setting default. So a lot of people have zero as a default until someone turns it in and you grade it. It shows up as a zero. That's especially important if you use points. Uh, you can hide grades. So if you don't want anyone to see their grade until everything is graded, uh, you can download 
the submissions in bulk if you are going to grade them offline. Um, and you can also message students who, and this is a, one of my favorite features in Canvas. So this allows me to message students who haven't submitted this yet. And just to say, just a reminder, last day to submit is Friday, right? I can also message students who have submitted it, but it hasn't been graded yet. just to let them know I plan to grade them this week or uh, I'm plan to get them graded by Saturday or whatever you want to tell your students whose work is sitting there but it hasn't yet been graded. Or if you left ungraded everybody who submitted it incorrectly, you can say heads up, please resubmit whatever you need to say that to those students. You can email students who scored less than an 80, less than a 70 and say, uh, great effort, but, you know, try again next time. Whatever you want to say to students who didn't score well. Or you can say, I'm giving you a chance to redo the assignment. And you can also reach out to students who scored more than an 89 and say, you know, awesome job. Great work. Uh, and just give them a little pat on the back. And so all of that is automated, right? You have to click on the button that says message students who, and you customize the message, but it is sent to students uh, based on this criteria here. So if you see that you have a lot of students who did not really well and you want to give them a chance to resubmit, if you see students did really well and you want to give them a high five, if you want to just remind students, that's probably the most used feature of message students who is to message students who haven't submitted yet. Um, but you can use those functions uh, to, to reach out to your students directly from the gradebook. All right. So I think I've got all of Bobby's questions, which is very good because I'm sure I was going to forget one of those. So I'm glad that you put all those criteria in there. Um, no need to apologize. It made sure that I remembered each of those. Um, it's going to guess the messages that you send to students through the gradebook will go to their MyTCC. It'll also go to their inbox. And that is what we're going to talk about when we get back from our five minute break. So I'm going to be here for those five minutes. Um, I'm going to mute just because I'm like going to gulp down some water. But if you have questions that you want to ask, you can. But I would recommend that you get up, walk around, you know, pet your dog, walk outside for a minute uh, and come back and we will reconvene at 7.44. So take a few minutes and we will be back at 7.44.
OK, so it is 744. Uh, I want to make sure I answer any questions we got. Um, so there's a multi part answer to Bobby's question. He asked if there uh, is cloud storage. Um, yes, and. <laughs> Uh, so I will say that you can um, store files in Canvas in your course files and uh, draw them up into modules when you need them. But something that you might make more use of is um, the connection and integration with OneDrive. So I'm just going to create a blank page here. And I'm going to go to the plugin and go to Office 365, which again really means OneNote, I mean OneDrive. And it's going to give you your whole OneDrive here. Uh, these are literally the files in my OneDrive. And if I wanted to uh, put one of them here in the course, I could, of course, this is how I grade students essay. So go to attach file. All right, and so, or if I highlight it, I can attach it so that it's a link to that, to those, whatever I just typed, so. There we go. It's a Canvas training plan, attach file. All right, so when they click those words, they open the file. Um, you can do something similar with Google Drive, of course. Um, you can do it through the plugin. I have actually found that it's easier to just open the file in Google uh, and click on share. And, sh you know, copy the link. All right, so and do it that way. Link, external link, done. But also, if you want to bulk upload a bunch of files, you can absolutely do that. So uh, go to files. In any course, you can upload files. So you'll, you can't see it, but I just had a menu come up. So I can choose 30 files at once if I want. Um, click open, and then it uploads all those files into the course. And then when I'm working, in a page, if I want, I can say right and then insert go to course documents and all the stuff that I just uploaded is right there. So you might find that easier depending on how you have your file saved. If you have them organized on your computer, it's probably faster to bulk upload them into course files. Just click on files uh, and that way you can, they're all in Canvas already and you can draw them up uh, through insert document. All right. Save and publish. And again, if you're in the modules page, you can click on plus and add a file. And if you can upload a brand new file, or you can go to your course files if you've bulk uploaded and add a file that way. And so when students open it, it's embedded. So really, whichever way you prefer to do it, whether that's using OneDrive, that's bulk uploading the course files, that's uploading them as you need, as you're creating pages, 
you can do any of those. And if these files are all in your Blackboard course, when you copy that course into Canvas, they will all be in your course files. So even if you have a course in Blackboard, you don't really like the way it's set up, you kind of want to just build the lessons over, it might be worth it to copy at least the files so you have your Word documents in your PowerPoints if you want to keep using those. All right. So we are ready to talk about inbox. So going back to our global navigation menu, you probably don't remember because I've told you a thousand things since then, but one thing you can do, students can do from the help menu is ask their instructor a question. And that will send you a message to your Canvas inbox and also to your Outlook. Canvas inbox looks just like a browser-based email inbox. So you have messages over here. You can pull them up over here. If I click here to compose a new message, I can. Um, if I'm a student enrolled in a particular course, I can select a course from my drop-down menu. I can search courses. I can look for people just in that course. So as a student, I might go to teachers and I want to email the teacher, right? But as a faculty member, you might want to select that particular course and then go to students and email a student. Now, that's not really a student. That's my coworker who's my pretend student here. So I don't even think I'm violating FERPA. Uh, but you can find your students and you can email all students in the class, if you want to send them a reminder. You can attach a file. Uh, you can create a media recording if you want to send them an audio or a video message using Studio, right? Students don't need to remember your name, although I hope they know your name. And they don't need to remember your email address. They can just go to Canvas Inbox, find the course that they're in, and then click on send it to teachers, all teachers. They can also send things to other students in their class. So they can go to students, they will see all their names. Um, so if they are trying to find their study group or their group for a group project, they can locate them here, or they can go to all, right? And they can send an email to all of their classmates and say, does anyone remember when this is due? Does anybody have access to this file? Um, does anybody want to study for the test on Monday? So it's very easy for students to interact with each other and to interact with you right here in the LMS. These messages live in the LMS. So you will have this inbox and all of your messages are here. Now, all of these are just test messages that I've been sending to people in training classes back and forth. <clears throat> and in fact, I can send a message if I want to just by typing someone's name. I could send a message to Irene. So I hit send. That message just went into Irene's inbox. So she'll now have a green uh, indicator right here with the number one. It also went to her Outlook account. If I had sent it to a student, it would have gone to their inbox and it also would have gone to their MyTCC email account. If they reply, so if Irene receives that message and replies to me from Outlook, I will receive her reply in both Canvas and in my Outlook email account. If a student replies to me from Gmail or from Canvas, I receive it in my Canvas inbox and in my Outlook account. Now, as I explain it, it sounds insane. It sounds like you're gonna get a million messages twice. But the good news is, if you are a person who is checking your Outlook all the time, then you will see your students' messages. If you are a person who is checking your LMS all the time, like me, I teach online, right? I have Canvas open basically the entire time I'm on my computer. I can set up a rule in Outlook that puts all of those messages in one folder. So they're not junking up my inbox. I'm going to see them in 
I guess I don't need them in Outlook, but I'm in Outlook. So if I'm on my phone, I'm checking my email, a student sends me a message, I'm going to see it. I can reply from Outlook and it goes to the student via the LMS. So I no longer have to worry about whether the student's email address is their TCC email. I don't have to validate their who they are. I don't have to make sure I'm sending it to the right person. I don't have to look up my student's email address and make sure I spell their name right and remember the 8277855 at the end of their email address. It's all taken care of. And if a student says, I emailed Professor Thrower 27 times, she never replied. Of course, Irene replied. And all of those replies are, guess what, in the LMS. So it's all in there. Uh, it's really designed to be very uh, safe and secure, but also very convenient for whatever your preferred communication style is. And again, if you would prefer that these messages go to your Gmail, you can do that in notifications. I'm sorry, in settings. You can add your Gmail account right here. So I went to my account, I went to settings, and right over here, I have the option to add additional contact methods. And then in notifications, I can change, you see I have my TCC and my MyTCC. So I can change where emails go if I wanted to keep doing it that way. And you'll notice I just got a message back from Irene. Thank you. And so she replied to me. I got a notification here. This blue dot in Canvas means you have something unread. And so I see Irene's message here. I also just got it to my Outlook. So that's Inbox. I'm actually going to open these just so they stop showing up as flagged. And that's available to you in your global navigation menu. So hopefully that makes communicating with students easier because you can do a lot of that messaging through the gradebook. Um, and then the rest you can do through inbox. And again, if you're like, I need to send an email to my student named Brian Cervantes, but I don't remember which numbers go in his email address. I don't have to anymore. All right. And if I just remember it's Brian from my particular class that I have, I can go to that class and then start typing his name and it will fill it in. All right, so that is Inbox. We've talked a little bit about creating assignments already. Um, I think I showed you the options and the rubrics but I will show you creating quizzes really quickly. So go back to my demo course. Canvas has two types of quizzes. They have what they call classic quizzes and they have what they call new quizzes and they have different question options and different functionality. Um, if you want to use Proctorio on a quiz, then you need to use classic quizzes. If you make a lot of quizzes, and you're really invested in understanding the ins and outs of each question type, I'm going to recommend these training videos to you because we don't get all the way in the weeds of quizzes here. But I will say that you can create a quiz inside of any module. So you click on the plus to add something to your module, and then you add a quiz. You can create a new quiz. You see, these are actually quizzes that I downloaded with a Norton course pack. So these are Norton quizzes that are in my course, but they're not associated with the module. So if I wanted to find a quiz and upload it into that module, I could. Or if I hit plus quiz and create a quiz, I have new or classic And then I could add it right there. In either case, if I open the quiz, 
I have the option of previewing it. So that shows me the question, the points each question is worth, and then what the answer choices are. I can edit the quiz. So if I have general instructions, I can type them here in the rich content editor. If I go to questions, I can edit in a specific. Oh my gosh, sorry, Teams is in my way. I can reorder the questions if that's what I want to do. Go back. If I want to edit. I select the pencil here. I can change the question. I can put a video in the question so I can say watch this video and then answer a question. I can upload an image so I can say what's happening in this picture or what's happening in this diagram. If that's what I want to do. Uh, and then here's the possible answers. And because this came from the publisher, uh, it has long information about feedback. But essentially, you can have it explain to students why they got it wrong or why they got it right. So they have comments that come up when they get a wrong answer and comments that come up when they get a right answer. Any of that you can change. You have the option of question types, so multiple choice, true or false, fill in the blank, uh, multiple drop downs, matching, all that kind of stuff. You have those options. You can edit the HTML. This is a full rich content editor. And then you can save and publish. You, show, you see it's published because it's green at the top. You can establish a rubric. You can lock a quiz. You can, um, after everyone has finished the quiz, you can show students the results. From here, you can message students who haven't submitted it, who haven't, it hasn't been graded. You can message students who passed it or didn't pass it. You can delete it. If I think this is a really spectacular quiz and I want you to be able to use it in your class, I can send it to you. I'm not going to send you this quiz, Irene, because I don't think you want it, but I could send it to her. Um, and then I could copy it if I wanted to to another one of my classes. So I have all of those options. So it's going to be pretty similar to um, the options that you have uh, from Blackboard. Is it graded, ungraded? Is it a practice quiz? Uh, you can choose what assignment group it goes into. You can shuffle the answers. You can put time limits. You can decide when students can see the correct answers, whether they see one question at a time or all of them. And then you can assign it uh, different due dates to different students if that's what you need to do. But make sure that you do put a due date on every assignment in Canvas. And so students would see this. when they go to take the quiz. So there's no time limit. There's seven questions. This is when it's due. And then I click take the quiz to get started. And then as a student, I would answer the questions. Hopefully I take more time reading them that I'm doing now. And then I click submit. I got two out of seven. All right, so that's kind of the student experience of taking a quiz, and then they see the feedback that has been put in there. So that's quizzes. From the quizzes menu, which again should be hidden from students because these are going to be out of context and not within the module, you can do a few things. Uh, this is where you're going to do things like question manage your question banks and your test banks. Um, and you can ch choose between whether your default is classic quizzes or new quizzes. And that's 
the basics of setting up a quiz. Um, if you see tests and quizzes over from Blackboard, they copy over just fine with their settings and their points and their rubrics. Um, you want to check them, of course, to make sure, but so far they've all copied over correctly. And if you have really in-depth questions or you want to know everything there is to know about quizzes, you can check out those videos that are linked in the training array. All right. I think we've gone through all of that. Let's talk about the calendar. And then I want to show you conferencing and grading. All right, so we talked about the calendar uh, a little bit. You see that there's a calendar icon in the global navigation menu. And you and students would get a view similar to this. You can uh, choose to turn on or off specific courses. So if you just want to see, a, right now I just want to look for assignments in biology. You can see that. Otherwise, it's going to color code. So each course is a little bit of a different color. Uh, if a student clicks on something, they will get information about the assignment, whatever you've typed into the Rich Content Editor. And then if they click this, it would take them directly to the assignment and open it. So they can submit it. You see all the due dates are here. If it's crossed out, that means that it's happened in the past. They can still read about it. But oops, it shows them that it's in the past. <clears throat> you have the option of creating things straight from the calendar. It's probably not the best way to do it. Um, but if, for instance, you are thinking about your summer two class and how you want to structure it out, you can, you know, say, I want to have test one here. Um, oops, I need to make that an assignment. So for my comp two class, I want test one there. And then I think test B here, right? If you want to just like sketch it out in your mind, you can do that. And then later you can open those up and fill in the details about what's on those tests and all of that. Um, but otherwise, I don't know why you would create assignments from the calendar, but you can. You can also give yourself a to-do list item. So this is something only you would see, but it would come up in your calendar. It would come up in your Canvas to-do list. So if you want to remind yourself to build a module or to open something up or to get something uh, assigned to students or to answer particular messages, you can give yourself a my to-do. And again, that's just for you. No one else sees that. And you can set up appointment groups so you can say, on Thursday, I'm available from 2 to 4, and students can go in and sign up for assignments that are 10 minutes long, that are 20 minutes long, that are 15 minutes long. They pick their own time slot, so you don't have to schedule all of those appointments. If you wanted to do one-on-one -on -one conferencing with students, you can do that using appointment groups. And really what I would do is create a Teams meeting, put the link in here, and then tell students which 15-minute slot to sign up for. But you can see that the calendar is really <clears throat> got functionality all over Canvas, not just in the calendar view, but here on my dashboard, I have to-do list that's based on due date. Students and faculty have a coming up, and that's based on due date. Inside of a specific course, you have a to-do list and a coming up of things that are coming up to be due. So the calendar functionality is very, very rich and really all throughout um, the LMS. I just wanna show you what a course summary looks like, in a course that's fully built. So you see, this is the course summary that gets automatically created by Canvas and all the things that are due on this day, students can see kind of very easily when are things due, they can search, and if they click the link, it will take them right to that item, organized by due date. And that course summary is created automatically by Canvas. 
and remember when we grades and that information is automatically generated and populated for students. So you don't have to type that out and put it in your syllabus. It's already there. All right, so I will tell you that one very cool feature is the rolling due dates. So if you are copying a course. <clears throat> so I went to settings. Let's say I'm going to import something. I'm going to copy a Canvas course. I'm going to search for what course I want to copy over and then I can adjust events and due dates. So last semester, the first date was January 11th. I don't know what it actually was. I'm just making this up. And then in the fall, it'll be, you know, August 23rd. And then this semester ended May 12th. And next semester is going to end. Oops. I don't know, December 15th, OK? And if I need to add a substitution, move it from Sundays, now they're due on Wednesdays. Or move it from Wednesdays, now they're due on Sundays. And then if I click import, all the content that gets copied over, it will roll those deadlines forward based on the new start date, the new end date, and whatever changes you've made. Now, there may be a couple that you have to adjust because you know spring break and then thanksgiving but for the most part 90 percent of that grade uh due date <clears throat> sorry 90 percent of that due date updating is already done for you when you copy something over so i just again you're in the course that you're importing to you click on settings import course content and then copy a canvas course if you are uploading something from Blackboard, that would be Blackboard zip file. And you have the option to adjust due dates. If you had due dates saved in your Blackboard course, you could adjust them when you open it in Canvas. And if you have a course pack from a publisher, it's like a IM cc file i believe that's a canvas course export package so you could upload that as well or import that as well all right so let's talk about teams in canvas now uh first thing i want to say is that uh microsoft and instructure um, the companies that own Teams and Canvas are working together to, to update this functionality. And by the time our fall courses begin, we will have even more ways to integrate Teams and Canvas. But I want to show you one thing that you can definitely do. Um, and then as functionality is added, we will update the training array. So I don't want you to think uh, that you're missing any important information. Anywhere that you have the rich content editor, so that's again a page, an assignment, an announcement. So I'm making a, an announcement here. So my title is Reminder Optional Course Meeting. So I'm going to say join us if you can for this review session. All right, and I'm going to go to this plug and I'm going to go to my Microsoft Teams Meetings plugin. going to ask me to sign in, but it's single sign on, so that should work pretty quickly. I'm going to create a meeting link for March 24th at 3 p.m. And I'm not putting this on their Outlook calendars the way I would be uh, if we were co-workers. So that's why I put it in the title of the announcement as well as I'm going to put it right here. I'm going to put it in the name of the meeting just so any of our students see this link 
and I also have this information. And so I click create. I'm going to copy that Teams meeting info, and it's going to put the join link right in the announcement. Okay, so then I would post this announcement and students would get that information. From the home screen, they would see. Oops. I'm going to go to student view real fast. Students get updates about announcements in their to do list. So this bullhorn means it's an announcement and if they click on it, they can read it and once they've read it, they can take it off their to do list by clicking this X. OK, they also. If you went down here to settings and did that secret thing I showed you earlier, oops, go down to course details. More options and I'm going to show the most recent announcement on the top of my home page. And I click save. Then students would also see that information right up here. And from the dashboard, which I can't show you in student view, they have a bullhorn that says there's an announcement in the class and this one. Means it's an announcement I haven't read. So if I open the course. I see. This announcement right here, and if I'm a student, this blue dot next to it tells me I have not read that yet. So lots of ways that your attention as a student is drawn to announcements. Um, and again, students will set up their notification settings for whether they get an email immediately or whether they get a daily summary, but you might want to advise your students to set it up to notify them immediately for announcements because announcements again tend to be very important, but you can also set up a teams meeting within a module again anywhere you have that rich content editor. Helps if you spell right. I can add that. And then I would follow the same process to use the plugin. And create a meeting. So some of the functionality that I think is coming pretty soon is um, that you can integrate a class team. So if you had a class, a team for your class in Microsoft Teams, you can integrate it with your Canvas section. Uh, that's not here yet, but once it gets here, we will update the training array. OK. Let me go back to my slides. Looks like I've done all. So I'm going to give you a minute to practice working with the calendar, practice setting up a Teams link. Uh, click around for, for a few minutes and then we'll move on to our next topic. OK. So I want to show you SpeedGrader uh, and you will see more of SpeedGrader in your level two training, but I do want to make you familiar with um, how assignments are graded. And uh, so let's go back and see if I can find. Which course I created. 
assignment in. I think it was this creative writing class. Yes, okay. So earlier in the training, I uh, created this imagery assignment. And remember that imagery assignment is where we looked at how you put in the points, how you put in what students upload, how you can attach turn it in if you want to, uh, how you put in a rubric. So this is that assignment. And then uh, from student view, I showed you how student would submit that assignment. And now let's look at how you would grade it. So you can access the speed grader and speed grader is just the, the kind of portal or the interface that you use for grading student submissions. You can access the speed grader from a lot of places. So from the dashboard, you'll see in your to do list that you have things that you need to grade. And if you click on them, it will open the speed grader. From inside the course, if you are looking at the assignment itself and you click on speed grader, you can jump right into the speed grader from there. So you can get there from your to do list, you can get there from the assignment itself. And if you're in the assignment in the grade book, you click the arrow, you can jump into the speed grader from there. So I know in um, Blackboard, you're used to going to needs grading and the to-do list in Canvas works the same way. It's gonna show you anything that has submissions and that's how you would uh, click on them to get to grading. But the, good, the best thing about the to-do list is that it is organized by due date. So the things that were due the longest time ago or the earliest, those are the things that are gonna be at the top of your to-do list. Um, and so that's very helpful in making sure that you grade things accordingly. <clears throat> so when I was that practice student, I just uploaded a syllabus as the file. So that's what you see here. Uh, and there's two panes and you can change the size of them by dragging this gray bar. Uh, over here, is the document that the student uploaded. This gray toolbar is will be available to you as long as the student uploaded something. If they just type text in a box or if you're grading a discussion, you won't have this gray toolbar, but you will still have all this functionality over here. So some of the tools that are available to you, of course, you can zoom in and zoom out. You can go to the next page. You can download the original file, so you can download the Word document. This is called a point annotation, but I think I call it like a flag comment. So you get a little flag. You can choose which color to make the flag and then just drop it on the student's work. Let me zoom out a little bit so you can see what I'm doing here. Drop it on the student's work and then you can write a little comment. You can highlight and then leave a comment. You can type directly on their work. Again, you can choose what color your text is and you can change the size. All right, so I wanna make that green or I wanna make that orange. For some reason, one of my choices is brown. I can make it bigger. I can strike through. If I wanna to suggest to students to take something out, I would say, and I can draw this box. And again, I can change the color of the box. And type a little comment there. And so you see it's, uh, similar tool set to what you had in Blackboard, but fewer clicks because again, I'm dropping the flag and then I'm immediately typing. I don't have to click again to get into the text box. Uh, and then it's very easy for me to delete it. If I accidentally drop that flag, I can delete it. And then the last tool you have up here is the pen and the pen, you still have the same color choices and you can change your line weight. Uh, I'm on my MacBook, so this is not going to go great, but if I 
uh, iPad or a pen or a pencil, you can really write directly on the student's work. I know you can technically do that now in Blackboard, but it doesn't really work very well. Um, it does work pretty well uh, in Canvas. So if you want to uh, draw a circle around things, or if you want to attempt, again, if I had my Apple Pencil and I was doing this on my iPad, you'd be able to read it, right? Um, and so you can write a comment about what you've drawn or written, or you can just leave the text on the page. So that's all the stuff available to you in the left hand pane right over here, which I'm going to make it bigger by dragging that gray bar. This 78% is actually the Turnitin report. So I checked my syllabus for plagiarism and it's apparently part of it is on Course Hero, right? So it's checking that. If I view the rubric, remember I attached a rubric to it earlier, so I would click these score point descriptors and it's going to add up the grade and I'm going to click save and it puts the grade in the box. And down here I can type a summary comment or let's say that this student submitted the wrong file. OK, and I want to say, oops, looks like you submitted, looks like you submitted the wrong file, please submit SA2, right? I can send that comment to the student without grading their work. And that goes to the student. The student is notified I put a comment. They can re-upload the correct file, and then they can put a comment in that says, OK, I resubmitted it. And remember, I have it set up so that assignment comments, I get notified immediately. Uh, in Blackboard, you can't type and submit a comment unless you type in a grade. So that's a little different. <clears throat> You can attach a document like a word file. You can create a media comment so that it's an audio or video message to let students know how they did on the assignment. Uh, and then once the grade. All right, so let's go back to having my rubric grade it. Once the grade is there, you will see up here a check mark next to the student's name that lets you know it's been graded. This shows you how many you've graded versus how many have been submitted. This is keeping a running average. Uh, of how your students have done on this assignment so far. So that changes with each one that you grade. And this is how many submissions the students made. It will default to show you the latest, but if you want to go back and look at an earlier submission, you can. And then you would click this drop down and you would get a list of your students' names here. Uh, you see test student has a check mark. That means it's been graded. Any students who hasn't been graded, it will have that blue dot next to their name. And if somebody hasn't submitted something, it'll be grayed out. So you can tell just from the drop down <clears throat> the status of each student. And then you click the next arrow and it brings you to the next student's submission. So it is called Speed Grader for a reason. You can get a lot done very quickly. You can get a lot of this deep rich feedback to your students really quickly. So I know that was very rapid. I promise they go over it in level two again, and um, we have some quick videos on speed grader as well. If you want to watch those, you can. I'm gonna wait and see if anybody has a speed grader question. See, Dr. Fung is typing one, so I'm going to go ahead and answer Bobby's question while she's typing. Um, I think you're talking about third party tools like Pearson and my math lab. And yes, I will show you how to set those up in just a moment, but they will sync with your grade book. Um, and if you use the course pack or the ebook and the uh, you need a code to access something in the third party tool, all of that is integrated into Canvas. I will show you that in just a moment. <clears throat> uh, I know that Word documents and PDFs 
work in speed greater in terms of being able to to use this that bar at the very top this work uh, with doc, with with Word documents and PDFs. You can have students submit a Google Doc. That does not allow you to use these tools up here, but you would be able to view the Google Doc in line. So it would show up in your grading panel and you could use the, the rubric and the summary comments uh, if they submitted a Google Doc. I don't think that pages files will show up. Uh, if you have a, you know, if you have a student who submits a pages file um, <clears throat> and you have your own Mac computer, you can download it and open it on your computer. But what I would recommend if you're teaching an English class like Dr. Fung and I would be, then I would go in the assignment setup. I would not let students do a text entry because that doesn't, if it's just text entered, um, then you can't write directly on their papers. So I would restrict their uploads to Word documents and PDFs. That means they can't upload anything other than a Word document and a PDF. So there is no, you uploaded the wrong file type. Canvas will just say you can't upload that type of file. You've got to upload a Word doc or a PDF. And that way you can definitely uh, use the full functionality of SpeedGrader and you don't have to bounce things back to students, Canvas will do that for you. I'm gonna close some of these windows that are just causing mass confusion here. All right. So I wanna show you a few more things um, in terms of resources, and then we will have time to answer just all your random questions. It'll be Stump Allegra time. So in your top five resources in the training array, one of those is third party integrations. Each of these works a little differently. So you have a lot of in-depth information on how to set up third party tools depending on which one you use. So you have Go React, you have Cengage, you have LinkedIn, McMillan, McGraw-Hill, Norton, Pearson, Pearson MyLab, Proctorio, Respondus, lots of different things, right? So if you use one, um, you can access these in-depth guides. They are PDFs, some of them are videos, some of them have screenshots. They're all pretty simple, uh, just a few steps, uh, and you can have students use the LMS. Uh, in the case of my math lab, for instance, students would really use the LMS as a pass through to go into my lab. It would sync with your grade book. If you're using uh, McGraw Hill, I think you set up all the assignments in McGraw Hill and then you publish them into Canvas. So they're in Canvas, but you set them up in McGraw Hill. So each one is a little different and you kind of have to go through the setup um, specific to your publisher. Same for Proctorio and Respondus. If you're choosing to use those, um, you set those up a little differently. Again, those can only be used with quizzes. And I think they can only be used with classic quizzes. So just keep that in mind. But all of that information uh, is in detail here. And then for Proctorio, there's a bunch of information that you can also share with your students. So if you're using this third party tools, that's where you would go to get information um, and guides on setting them up. It's in the training array, uh, in the top five resources, um, third party tools. And speaking of training, I wanna show you something in the help menu. So help again is every kind of help, whether you have an, students have a question for you, you have a question for tech support, you're looking for that quick link, um, but if you click on training services portal from the help menu and you click on authorize, it will take you to the subscription training portal. This is an extra feature that TCC is paying for 
and TCC is paying for unlimited subscription training. And there are lots of different resources in here from Instructor. So there are pathways, which are videos and courses and uh, kind of like an asynchronous thing that you move through, um, packaged together on specific topics. So something like Canvas and Microsoft Office. Uh, when the Teams integration is ramped up, I'm sure there will be content in this training portal about it. There are asynchronous courses that take anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour. So again, if you probably don't need the K through two teachers, but you might be interested in best practices for course design. And so it kind of tells you who the audience, which audience it's appropriate for there. These are videos, and these are just really high quality videos made by Instructor about topics that are frequently asked about. So announcements, the inbox, the speed grader. Um, so if you forgot everything I told you about the speed grader and you don't want to go back through this three hour recording, you can come in here and watch, you know, a 12 minute video, uh, 14 minute video on how to use the speed grader and what all the different functions do. So those are videos. There's also live trainings that you can access. And again, we have unlimited access to these trainings. So if you're interested in integrating OneDrive, if you're interested in the best ways to use modules, if you're interested in um, your account settings or mobile apps, turn it in, right? These are all about an hour long and you can, uh, Let's say that you want to make some new quizzes, right? You can click on view sessions and they will tell you when are the next sessions coming up. You can click right here and register. You can take the same course an unlimited number of times. You can take every single course they have available. Unlimited means unlimited. I have the hiccups again. You can also click on training calendar. And so if you're like, you know what, I have two hours tomorrow. I wonder if there's anything good happening. You can click on calendar. This does take a minute to uh, to pop up. And so you can say, oh, there's something about the grade book. Maybe I'll jump into that. It's at 8 a.m. So I'm going to register for it straight through the calendar. You will also get proof that you attended. So you can put that information um, in the Learn Center yourself, or you can keep that proof and share it with your supervisor if you want to use that for professional development credit. If that's something that your supervisor is willing to approve for PD credit, then you can use that. But it will give you like a little certificate that says that you completed it. <clears throat> and I think if you go to My Learning, yes, it will give you a transcript of everything that you've done in the training portal so that you can, so I got a little file. Um, so if I needed documentation of what I had completed, I would be able to do that. So that is subscription training. And again, you explore it, find things that are interesting. Um, and, you know, if you start a video or you start a, you know, a pathway and you're like, this is for me, you don't have to finish it. You can come back and do it later. You can do it 20 times. Doesn't matter. It's a resource available to you. So I'm going to go through these slides one more time. And I'm just going to make sure that we have covered these topics. Um, to some degree. Awesome, okay. So we have about 20 minutes and um, I know that you might have a question about how something works in Canvas. You might not be sure about something. There might be something I went over too quickly. There might be something I never brought up that you were hoping to hear more about. Um, so this is really just open question time. I'm also going to let you come off mute because I know sometimes it's a new system. It's just easier to explain it than it is to type it out. So I will figure that out one second. Yes. 
So you can come off mute if you want to unmute yourself and ask loud, uh, or if you have a question in, let me know. So just really anything about Canvas, again, it can be repeat it because you didn't catch it the first time, or it can be something we didn't cover yet. Either I want to make sure that you're done today knowing all you need to know to get started. The level two training is only two hours. And so it will be a deeper dive into some of these topics. And then we have all of those resources, the, the long videos, the short videos, the training array, and the subscription training portal all available to you so that you can you know, further study Canvas. So let me know what questions you have um, as you're clicking through and thinking about setting up your courses. And yes, if you are here, and you are signed up for this training in the Learn Center, I will mark you present. It might not be tonight. It might be tomorrow that you get marked present. Um, and then you just need to sign up for level two training and take that. And Bobby, that's a great question. Either you get paid for it as part of your eight hours, um, or it's something you want to ask your supervisor about. But my understanding is that it's part of the you can use it towards your eight hours of required training, and you do get that $200 adjunct uh, stipend. Full-time faculty will not get paid for attending the course. <clears throat> but the even, but I mean, everybody has said this, this is definitely qualifies as professional development. So we will get it documented uh, and just make sure everybody signs up for level two training, because that is also required. So that's a great question, and I would actually love to show you all this. Our students will get access to Canvas on uh, June 15th, I believe. It's the middle of June. It might be like the 16th. but um, And you're all enrolled in the Canvas Training Array of students. Students are all enrolled in the TCC Student Hub. And this includes um, connecting them to the libraries and the tutoring centers. It connects them to uh, TCC resources, to student organizations, but it also has a how-to guide for Canvas. So this is a module for students on using Canvas. And you see it has some getting started videos some FAQs, and this is these are like the really important things, like how do I find things? How do I submit assignments? How do I know when assignments are due? And then we have success in online classes, and so if you're a student taking an online class, that's for you. And then some additional helpful tips. And students also have that checklist to help them. And the checklist for students first, how to find your course, um, setting up notification preferences, downloading the app, navigation, visiting the student hub, setting up, you know, their favorites, reading the syllabi, um, and then checking the calendar. So we have that checklist for students. All of that is in this student hub. They will, if, if, if a student is new to TCC and they're going through new student orientation, there will be some time spent on Canvas, just like there was some time spent on Blackboard in previous semesters. Um, and then students, you know, can submit this um, survey that says, is there something that you need us to add to this module? Uh, in terms of student training. So they have that option of giving us feedback um, if they need additional resources. So right now, Rodney, all of our classes are still in Blackboard. 
So if you have been assigned to the course as an instructor in Blackboard, uh, my.tcd.edu, uh, and the course, we will start using Canvas in summer two. Uh, unless you're using unless you're using TCC Plus, in which case um, you will be in Blackboard for summer two. And then everybody will be in Canvas for the fall and moving forward. So I'm glad somebody asked about students. Um, uh, students are all enrolled in this now and they will have access to it June 15th. So that gives, you know, if we have students who are anxious about getting used to Canvas, they will have two weeks before summer two starts um, that they can play around in the student hub. And then just like the training array, uh, you know, once we get through the summer and we get all the initial training done, the uh, instructional designers from TCC Connect will keep this space updated as well. So it will be an active living space um, for students, just like the training array is for faculty. Also, I don't know if you knew this, I just learned this today, you can move tiles around on your dashboard just by dragging and dropping them. So please let me know what other questions you have. How do I do this? How do I do that? And again, you're welcome to use your mic and come off mute if you'd rather ask it out loud. Okay, so I'm going to be here for 15 more minutes. I'm sticking around till nine. That's what I'm getting paid for. Um, <laughs> but you're welcome to log off if you're feeling comfortable and confident, if you are ready for your level two training, if you know how to access all of the resources and you don't have any burning questions, if you're not feeling any anxiety or panic, um, you're welcome to log off. If you have questions or you do have some kind of anxiety or fear or panic, Stick around um, and you're welcome to ask me questions. Again, I will be here till nine, um, no matter what. And you guys have been so nice and so gracious. So I appreciate that, asking great questions. Um, hopefully keeping up with me as I move through the training. So I appreciate that immensely. Well, Julie, if you send me an email, I will send you my reading list for my classes. Unless you're just being polite, which is okay too, but yeah. I'm going to mark you as having attended in the Learn Center, um, and you'll see that probably by tomorrow afternoon. And you will have access to this recording in Microsoft Stream. All right, I'm going to stop the recording, but I'm still here. Also a great question. So you will need to enter final letter grades in WebAdvisor, um, you will enter those yourself. Um, there is no grades journey, 
But uh, when we switch from colleague to our new ERP, the hope is that we'll have a way of doing that. But for, for at least you'll be in your own grades. Um, that's a great, great question, Dr. Fung. Uh, they go over, well, I'll just show you. So Canvas Commons is uh, how folks share content in Canvas. Everybody in the world who uses Canvas has access to the Commons. That's why um, there's 200,000 things in here, and there will be more every time you look. But if you filter for Tarrant County College, you will see that the course template is here, and you will also see that there's a home page template here. And so this is the recommended home page for your Canvas course. And uh, this has, you know, a welcome banner. These buttons will work in your course. This will take students to your modules. This will take students to your syllabus, to your announcements. you want to import it to and then click on import and then just put that home page template into your course so then you want to open your course and you go to pages and view all pages and i have found it's helpful to just search for home Or what? what is it called? Did I not copy it here? My goodness. There's too many pages in this course. Oh, it's called, it is called welcome. Why did it not come up in my search? All right. So anyway, when you search, it'll be called a homepage template. Um, and then you make it your front page. You just click the kebab right over here to make it your front page. And then on home, you click choose home page. And so really you either want your syllabus or your front page to be a home page because we want students to open a course to something that's inviting them to the course, that's pleasant, that's welcoming. So um, I would choose, you know, this home page that I designed and then you can edit the content. So that's, you can say welcome to the class. You can change the banner. You can type in, you know, your email address and all of your specific in information and then save. And that makes it your home page. And one thing I um, hope they show you in level two training is that there are hundreds of banners available to you in the training array. You just, again, go to Quick Links, and there is a bank of course banners, so you can find a banner that matches your course or one that you like the design of, uh, download it and upload it, download it to your computer and then upload it to your Canvas course. So you can make your own, but uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of banners in here that you can choose from. So again, you get the home page template out of Commons, you import it into your course, and then you can edit it. Go back to a course that had. I clicked on the wrong course. <laughs> you edit it and you can change this banner, upload your own, these buttons will work and then you change your text here. So yes, we would recommend that you have the home page, just like um, recommend that you have only specific links showing for students, and that way everybody opens their course and they know what's what. Um, as far as I know, every publisher and every third party um, system that we use uh, is a Canvas partner. So um, all of those things that we were using in Blackboard as LTIs, they work in Canvas. 
Um, the contractors we use for the help desk were already trained on Canvas before we did it. Our IT, so our tier two support has gone through um, several days of Canvas training. So they are very knowledgeable in Canvas as well. So basic questions would go to tier one support. And they already knew how to use Canvas. And then our team who answers the more challenging questions, um, they have been trained since January, February, they started training. I don't know what a test generator is, so I'm not sure how to answer that question. If you're talking about pooled questions, question banks, um, polling questions. Um, oh, so you would use, I believe, uh, I can't remember, but to make a Word document into a test, if it's already a test in Blackboard, then it copies over just fine. So any test that you have already in Blackboard um, will copy over, but there is a way to do it. I just can't remember. What it's called. I think that's what one thing that we use Respondus for. Um, so Respondus is a lockdown browser, but I think it's also a test generator. I'm going to look in the training array. Um, so the decision was made by uh, a team that included faculty, folks from IT, folks from procurement, uh, folks from district academic affairs. Uh, we evaluated three LMSs and we selected Canvas primarily based on functionality and support. Um, cost is a part of every decision, but um, I don't think it's a secret that uh, Canvas is not the cheapest LMS in the world. So it was definitely not a decision based primarily on cost. Um, it was primarily based on functionality and support for users. So training and access to things like the, the training support portal. Um, everyone who's familiar with both Blackboard and Canvas would definitely call it an upgrade. So, yes. If you go to the Respondus Guide, you can find out about the test generator. Um, do you mean certified to teach online? No. Everyone has to go through this five hours of Canvas training. Uh, but if you were certified to teach online previously, then you are still certified to teach online at this time. No recertification requirement at all. Dual credit switching to Canvas. Um, most of our, well, I don't know about most, many of the ISDs where we have dual credit, those ISDs are already using Canvas. So for instance, students in Mansfield um, have been using Canvas in Mansfield ISD for years. Um, but yes, all dual credit, early college, high school, continuing education, online, hybrid, campus, they're all, uh, all switching to Canvas. This is fun. I called it Stump Allegra time and Bobby is super trying to do that and I appreciate it. <laughs> and I'm not joking either. I'm having fun, so. 
Well, thank you. You guys have been super nice. And I guess it is nine o'clock, so we will end the training and let them run the attendance report. Again, I probably won't put your attendance in because I uh, want to stop working, but I will put it in tomorrow for sure. And um, if you have, if <laughs> yes, go Avengers. Uh, if you have more questions or uh, need more resources, once you've gone through level two training, um, you should have access to everything you need. So don't feel frustrated. You'll get there for sure. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. You guys are so nice. All right.